Thank you very much. Um, I will talk about the implementation of ECHR judgments in Azerbaijan. Uh, um, and as the title suggests, there will be challenges and perspectives, mostly challenges, um, very little perspective, I'm afraid. Um, so to start with, I want to highlight several factors which are conducive to the implementation of ECHR judgments in general. And I think we've been talking about them throughout these last two days, starting with political will within the state to implement decisions, human rights defenders who are free to exercise their freedom of expression, an impartial judiciary is absolutely instrumental to good implementation rate, effective investigation of ill treatment in custody, and checks and balances on executive power. Um, now, I will tell you a little bit of the background of uh, Azerbaijan's uh, human rights record in the last few years. Uh, All Rich Azerbaijan ratified the ECHR in 2002, and to start with, it set its course towards its European family. So it set uh, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline was a big political and economic statement towards Azerbaijan's um, direction that it was taking in its politics, as in turning towards Europe as opposed to Russia. It used various other means, for example, Eurovision Song Contest. It didn't spare any um, <laughs> expense to host it. But unfortunately, it attracted not only attention of other European countries in terms of its uh, singing talent, but also there was a campaign uh, organized by Rasul Jafar, Sing for Democracy. So everyone who uh, came to the contest um, were encouraged to comment on the state of human rights in Azerbaijan. So unfortunately, it received a lot of negative attention that it did not anticipate at the time. Then uh, in 2014, it became, Azerbaijan became the chairman, it took over chairmanship of the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers. And again, it was reminded that human rights starts at home. Um, the message was not well received. And so as the country was preparing for European Olympic Games in 2015, they were keen to silence anyone who dared to criticize and raise the issue about human rights within the country. So um, coupled this background coupled with the change in the political climate in the neighboring countries, um, in Russia and Turkey, with which Azerbaijan enjoys close cultural and political links. Um, also, uh, that human deterioration of human rights in those countries had an impact within the country as well. So in 2014, <coughs> there was an unprecedented crackdown on civil society. And um, the, this background explains the factors which are impacting the failure of Azerbaijan to implement ECHR's judgments. Um, I will speak about uh, the factors in more detail in a minute, but just to highlight that there are politically motivated imprisonment of opposition leaders and the lack of political will to implement those judgments. There's a shrinking space for human rights defenders and lawyers. A judiciary is still weak and uh, there, are, there is a lack of investigation in Ill treatment, of ill treatment in custody and excessively strong executive power. So I'll start with the uh, uh, politically motivated imprisonment. This is Ilgar Mamadov. He was an uh, uh, outspoken um, political uh, figure. He, he's in opposition. He wanted to stand for elections in 2013. Um, he is a blogger, so he raised a lot of awareness around human rights issues in the country. Uh, in 2013, there was a um, riot in Ismaili, <coughs> and he went to report, so he observed, he eyewitnessed the riots, and then reported on them in his blog. Shortly after, he was called into police, detained, questioned, and eventually imprisoned. So uh, he was sentenced to seven years in jail. The international community, there was a massive political outcry. Um, interestingly, his documents never made it in time to the, he applied to become a president <laughs> while in custody, but his documents never made it. The international community demanded fair trial. They openly said that it was a politically motivated persecution on trumped up charges, um, but nothing happened in terms of his release. 
So in May 2014, the court held that there has been a violation of Articles 5, uh, 5 1C, 5462, and 18 taken together with Article 4, uh, 5. The decision became final in October 2014 when the ECHR rejected the appeal from the Azerbaijani government. And ever since 4th of December 2014, the Council of Europe demanded that Ilgar Mamadov be released immediately. He's still detained. Those requests were completely ignored. And as far as I know, the government is working on a similar judgment um, as Russia did um, to justify this um, lack of action on their behalf. So this is one of the problems which affects the implementation of judgments in Azerbaijan. The second issue I'd like to look at is the shrinking space for human rights defenders. <coughs> Leila Yunus is, and her husband as well, are well-known human rights uh, defenders and civil society activists in Azerbaijan. They were arrested in 2014 and convicted for eight and a half years of imprisonment. Um, the charges were large-scale fraud and high treason. Um, the, uh, the ECHR adopted interim measures to grant the applicant medical uh, care because sh she developed diabetes while she was in custody. Um, they didn't give her medication, so she had to suffer for a long time. Her cellmate's been um, abusing her, and um, there was um, her lawyer came out and openly said about what was going on with her and uh, expressing his concerns about her well-being, uh, but nothing, no investigation was done in that respect. The ECHR found unanimously that there was a breach of Articles 34 and 3 of ECHR. She's been released, but she still deemed to be, um, she's deemed to be convicted. So th this case raises two particular issues for me, further issues. One of them, lawyers who defend the rights of political prisoners. So Leila Yunus's case was represented by two lawyers, Khalid Bagirov and Alayev Hassanov. Khalid Bagirov was debarred for making critical remarks about the lack of implementation of the Ilgar Mamadov versus Azerbaijan case. His case is currently pending before the ECHR. And Alayev Hassanov was debarred after he publicly shared that Leila Yunus's settlement exerted pressure on her. Um, so her cellmate basically filed a complaint against him and um, the association of um, the bar association decided that he can't practice. Uh, but uh, when we look at how other lawyers representing cases before the European Court of Human Rights are targeted, it becomes clear that there is a pattern. For example, Intikam Aliyev and Rasul Jafarov were also imprisoned. So that's one aspect that uh, cases like Leila Yunus reveal as in um, what happens to human rights defenders. The second aspect, it's possible only because there is a poor performance of the judiciary. Um, the prosecution of human rights defenders lacked evidence to arrest, detain, and substantiate the charges. The European Court of Human Rights case law makes it uh, clear that there were no for example, in the Ilgar Mamadov case, they decided there was no legal basis for that um, judgment. Now, the judicial system supports the executive in exerting pressure on them. So first of all, judges are appointed for three years to start with. They're on probation, and they can be appointed for life only, um, in practice, only if they align their views with that of the government. Um, also, allocation of cases is, done, uh, is not automatic, so it's not a random choice of judge. So cases which are um, expected to be high profile and highly sensitive cases are allocated to judges who perhaps uh, would go along with what government wishes. The next issue I'd like to touch upon is the lack of effect effective investigation of ill treatment in custody. Emin Husseinov um, is a well-known journalist and, um, in Azerbaijan. He was arrested in a cafe for uh, participating in a private party celebrating Shaguara's birthday. 
He had to be admitted to uh, intensive care at a hospital following the release from police custody. Um, and uh, his case made it to the European Court of Human Rights. The court had no difficulty finding that there was breach of articles 3, 5, 1, and <coughs> 11. It was a unanimous decision. But what it highlights also that uh, safety of journalists in the country um, is problematic. So they cannot necessarily always raise awareness about human rights situation and be safe. Emin Seynov feared for his life. He, was, he actually had to live in Swiss embassy in Azerbaijan for 10 months. And eventually they managed to get him out of the country. He got asylum in Switzerland in four months. And he can't return. <coughs> Um, journalist Rasim Alif wasn't as lucky, he was murdered, and there is lack of investigation into that, even though Parliamentary Assembly and the European Parliament called on the government to conduct investigation into his death. So this brings me to the final, perhaps the most important issue which underpins everything I've been talking about so far, and that's excessively strong executive power. Khadija Ismailova's case um, illustrates that quite neatly because she, she's an investigative journalist <coughs> and she delved into the investigating the wealth of the country's first family as, a, as in the president. Um, she was arrested in December 2014 and sentenced to seven and a half years in jail. And there was no doubt within the international com uh, community that her um, trial was politically motivated um, there were various scandals within the country. For example, there was a pornographic footage of her and she was threatened that it will be made public if she doesn't cease this investigation. She didn't stop and then um, they decided to follow it up with a trial. Now her case is currently pen pending before the ECHR. Along with the similar, many similar cases crippling the country's independent civil society, but what's worrying is that the power of the executive is getting stronger. On 26th of September 2016, there was a re referendum on amendments uh, to the national constitution, which further strengthened the power of the executive. Now, not only the president extended his own term to seven years, um, but also there are lots, uh, many provisions where um, the enjoyment of rights is restricted based on limitations of law. Now, what's also interesting is that article, newly inserted Article 98, gives the power to the, par uh, uh, the president to dissolve the parliament. So obviously, if parliament doesn't enact the laws which would suit the government, chances are they will be released. That it's another mechanism of putting pressure on other um, branches of um, the, the executive, judicial, and the legislative branches of the uh, government. Uh, studies also show that uh, when judgments are not executed in less, uh, in, in countries with less uh, stable democracy, chances are they will re remain that way because there aren't enough checks and balances on the powers of the executive. And also, uh, more constrained executives are more likely to implement controversial judgments on torture and inhuman treatment. Neither of these factors exist in Azerbaijan, and com uh, coupled with a lack of political will and a crackdown on civil society, uh, the implementation rate is likely to deteriorate further. And there, there were um, many calls on Azerbaijan to cooperate, um, to execute the more controversial judgments like Ilgar uh, Mamadov's case, um, but none of the Committee of Ministers' decisions were uh, followed up. They didn't even respond. Um, there is also um, calls from the Parliamentary Assembly and the European Parliament, to, um, uh, which condemn the unprecedented repression of civil society and call on changes from the Azerbaijani government. <coughs> but again, uh, not much action is uh, taken to address those uh, concerns. And so uh, this leads 
to question whether Azerbaijan is still on that course that it started in terms of facing towards European family. Is it still, uh, does it still want to be democratic? Does it still want to be, um, wants to be seen as one of the members of the Council of Europe? The annual report of the ECHR suggests that there is a drop in number of cases brought before the European Court of Human Rights that can do with, potentially do with the fact that there aren't many people who can bring those cases safely. Um, and 19 cases uh, in 2015, there were 19 cases which found violation against Azerbaijan and um, they suggest that the democracy itself are under threat uh, in the country. So there is lack of invest uh, effective investigation. Um, there are cases against uh, uh, concerning right to liberty and security, right to free elections, and so on. So all of them are signaling that Azer if Azerbaijan wants to remain the part of the um, Council of Europe, then uh, something drastically different needs to be done to address these concerns. Um, now to perspectives, uh, not very optimistic perspectives, but uh, on 16 December 2015, the Secretary of General um, started an investigation into Azerbaijan's compliance with the ECHR. That's, um, although there are eight similar investigations, this is the first time when the Secretary General initiated this procedure. Um, but still, even though it's fairly bleak outlook, the ECHR judgments enable access to justice to political activists and human rights defenders. That's the only beacon of hope within the country. Um, and those decisions let the international community hear voices we may not hear otherwise. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed not an easy task after the lunch uh, to uh, get the attention of the audience, including myself. Um, but I think uh, we have uh, so we have 15, maybe a little bit more minutes for questions from the audience. Um, I open the discussion. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I have one uh, comment and one question. One comment uh, concerns enforcement of the regard of other judgment. Yeah. And here we should be a little bit careful. It does not follow strictly from the judgment of the European Court that Mr. Mamadov should be released. What the court found? The court found violation of Article 5 in conjunction Article 5, Paragraph 1C in conjunction with Article 18. So. Pre-trial detention of the applicant was in violation of the convention. Nowadays, the applicant is also, uh, already under post-conviction yeah. So it is true that the Committee of Ministers interpreted and said, look, because the very criminal proceedings against him are very questionable, he should be released. But I, I will not exclude that the Azerbaijan will challenge it because purely, legally speaking, it, it doesn't follow from protocol. But in this uh, respect, I have a question to you. You know, Azerbaijan is front runner in terms of Article 18, and uh, only the funding of violation of 18 in Edgar Mamada was a huge step forward comparing to previous cases, Russian cases, cases against UK, there is the forum, and then we have uh, Sergio Farah. And then if you see now new judgments on Article 18 and complications on Article 18, you might mention that in many cases the applicant themselves did not uh, raise this provision. Yeah. I think government doesn't like that, especially where it wasn't raised and the court brought it um, forward. Um, obviously, that creates more <coughs> resistance from the government to implement the decisions where that was raised. Um, but equally, as you say, it's quite positive that those that provision is raised and there was violation. The fi they found violation, so uh, it goes both ways. It's not an easy. It doesn't make the implementation easier. Uh, but it's got tremendous benefits in terms of raising the issues within the countries at a bigger, um, platform, on a bigger platform. Yes? Um, I have a question, but also before that, I wanted to hear your comments on Article 18 that have been made. 
anything's important or it can be counterproductive. And I, perhaps my position comes to me from the, from the trend side because I was one of the legal representatives of the Sultra Farah and two other pending cases before the court now. And, and one thing that I can say where um, the human rights defenders and lawyers find Article 18 crucial is the establishment of the fact of the political motivation and the pr pr prosecution as such um, in, in a legal way because uh, to, 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 until that judgment um, came, came into force, um, the whole discussion of uh, the existence of political prisoners and other Jamaicans, which stemmed from the Jamaican succession to the Council of Europe, had been carried out on a political platform, where at this time was the first time there was a legal basis for that discussion as well. And, and without having such a um, establishment of such a fact by the court, the, 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 the local the society cannot even you know, effectively engage in any discussions with the authorities because they would argue that this is, this is one side and we have a different position of issues. So I think from that perspective, it's, it, it is very crucial to have article 18. Um, and, and I have a question. Obviously, I think we understand that Azerbaijan is perhaps the most depressing case in terms of implementation in, in, in the Council of Europe, although we have many other um, countries with difficult situations. But my question mainly relates to the legitimacy of the, of the courts and the convention in the eyes of, of Azerbaijan, of the state, because on one hand, we all see how the government blatantly ignores certain judgments, including the government. On the other hand, um, Azerbaijan, for example, is still a very good, sort of rather good implementer of, of individual mm -hmm. measures, including the, the, the just satisfaction, which to date has been always paid in most cases. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like we discussed yesterday, uh, how important the dialogue is. So when you look at what how the government presents itself at the Council of Europe level, it, again, it, it does sort of engage in some sort of dialogue uh, uh, to some extent, um, kind of reiterating its commitment to the Council of Europe, which they did last week as well before the committee, saying how they how important the implementation of judgment is, and they, they still maintain the integrity, commit to the integrity of the system, and so on. Whereas on the domestic level, um, um, the national authorities, including the president, proactively engages in the completely opposite rhetoric, where it gives in, in the <coughs> speeches, they refer to the fact how the Council of Europe wants to change the position of values and, and, and discredit um, the, the, the government and the country and so on. So I, I was wondering how you would explain this. I'm really confused in understanding what the legitimacy issue of the court is in the eyes of the government, because I tend to believe that perhaps there is a big problem with legitimacy already, but at the same time, why would then the government, um, does the fact that they pay just satisfaction in most, in all cases, does it mean that it's still, still, so I guess it also refers to the question we had earlier about the lack of consistency mm -hmm. in, in interpretation and case also in, in the application of the... Azerbaijan cares deeply about the way it's seen in the international community and it, it definitely wants to present itself as a democratic state. So in that sense, it takes the European Court of, it, the European Court of Human Rights cases quite seriously and paying just satisfaction is not a problem. So money, when it comes to money, they can pay. But then it goes to more systemic and problematic issues with the structure of the judiciary, for example, the structure of division of powers within the uh, executive and um, le legislative and um, judicial branches. And it's not just, like the whole system needs revamping. It's not just the government. Of course, the government leads the way, but then there are no balancing powers within the society to pull it back a little bit. So, for example, with the judiciary, there was a parliamentary assembly a report on corruption within judiciary, and Azerbaijan was named among um, other several other countries as well. As uh, the, basically, the judges are seen as the most corrupted layer of the society. Right? So there is no trust from people towards uh, the judges. There is no trust towards the government. Um, the laws are deemed unjust to an extent especially now that the constitutional changes brought in more opportunities to limit the rights. 
So the only recourse people have is the European Convention of Human Rights. So in that sense, um, within the society, there is some hope. So the, the, the judgments get legitimacy that way because they threaten the government that they will go to the court. <coughs> um, but still, uh, in terms of the implementation, it's not as straightforward. So they do care about how they're seen and perceived and they want to comply where they can, but they don't want to back on things which are important to them for for a reason, most important for the reason. I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions if the audience has a question. No? Then I think uh, we should yeah we should thank uh, uh, Bilar for participating for our presentation and wish her a safe flight. Thank you. Thank you very much.